The College Board cuts off our David story with the Oath of the Horatii in 1785, just before the revolution breaks out and just before David's story, and Francis starts getting a whole lot more interesting and a whole lot bloodier. Here's another of David's French Revolution paintings submitted to the French Academy after the National Assembly had met and called for a new constitution, and after the Paris mob stormed the Paris prison, the Bastille. I could really imagine this work, or the death of Socrates that we saw earlier, showing up in an attribution question, since both paintings have a classical theme, a contemporary political message, and David's characteristic focus on line and contour. Here again, David's classically educated viewers would have known this story well. Brutus's sons had attempted to overthrow the Roman Republic and restore the monarchy. So, in an act of loyalty to the Republic, the father ordered the execution of his own sons. The message was pretty clear. Be prepared to sacrifice everything for the revolution, even your near and dear. And, as political predictions go, this one was spot on. The tennis court oath represented an all too brief moment of national unity. In the years that followed, an increasingly radical faction took power in France, sending anyone who disagreed or had even the slightest association with the aristocracy or the church into the deadly embrace of Madame Guillotine. David threw in with this crowd, led by Maximilien Robespierre and Jean-Paul Marat, and in fact he became their minister of propaganda. Here's a sketch that David made standing in an upstairs window as he watched the revolutionary troops lead Queen Marie Antoinette to the guillotine. As a member of the convention, France's ruling legislature, he had voted for her execution. After knocking off this sketch, David raced to a ceremony to unveil a work the convention had commissioned, a tribute to one of their members, the recently assassinated Jean-Paul Marat. Here's the painting, and it is a propaganda piece, one of the most brilliant in the history of art. Marat suffered from a disfiguring skin disease. In David's painting, his skin miraculously has cleared. The note that the dead Marat is clutching is not the note that the young assassin, Charlotte Corday, sent to gain an audience with Marat. Her note actually contained a list of supposed traitors <coughs> excuse me, who deserve to lose their heads. Instead, David has painted Marat clutching a letter to a poor widow, offering Marat's help and financial assistance. A letter, by the way, that David totally fabricated to win more sympathy for Marat. Moreover, David has deliberately borrowed Christian imagery to convey martyrdom. The resemblance to Michelangelo's Pietà is no accident. When the head-chopping phase of the resolution ended with the execution of its leader, Robespierre, David came very close to making the personal acquaintance of Madame Guillotine. He was imprisoned but eventually pardoned. After this near brush with death and a short period of exile, David transferred his loyalties to France's new demagogue, Napoleon, and once again he took up his paintbrush in the service of political propaganda. Ever obedient to his new master, David made several changes to this painting at Napoleon's request, including painting the Pope with his hand raised in blessing, which historically is quite dubious. And get a load of this highly romanticized and highly unlikely vision of Napoleon riding a bucking horse along a steep precipice in the Alps. We'll leave David now, but not Napoleon just yet, on to Goya, the Napoleonic Wars and Romanticism. Do not panic. We are going to cover all of these points as we go along. Consider this slide like your first glance at the map before that maddening Google Map lady's voice starts telling you where to turn. I've talked many times about how each new artistic generation likes to rebel against the older generation, and Romanticism is no exception. Oh, all oh, that emphasis on pure reason. It struck many artists as cold and unfeeling, especially after so many of the generation that worshipped at the altar of reason showed to be distressingly willing to spill a lot of blood in its name. But the call for liberty, equality, and fraternity nevertheless ignited a passion for freedom, which many romantic poets and artists interpreted not just or even as much as political freedom from political tyranny, tyranny as social freedom from
from society's rules or personal freedom. Of course, the Enlightenment thinking already included what would prove to be a strong romantic element represented by Rousseau. Up until now, this emphasis on feeling and freedom had shown up mostly in naturalistic landscapes or sentimental paintings of simple peasant families. But now, painters began to explore the scarier underbelly of feelings and emotions. Nightmares, the macabre, beauty that was maybe more unearthly than real, all summed up, as your homework noted, in the term sublime. Nature to the Romantics was not merely a source of beauty, it was also a source of terror. An allegory, if you will, for the bestiality that humans visited on one another. Romantic art also saw a Baroque-style theatricality, a longing for what seemed the simpler and more religious days of the Middle Ages, and a revulsion against the perceived ugliest of urbanization and industrialization. Don't worry, we are going to get to all of those points. Indeed, I usually save these summary slides for the end of a lecture, but I started off with a summary of Romanticism because I now want to backtrack and look at an artist whose career mirrored the move from aristocratic Rococo to Enlightenment rationalism to Romantic sublime and even horror. That artist is Goya. You've probably gathered that I am not crazy about David. I find his paintings brilliant, but cold and fanatical. My opinion doesn't matter, of course, except that you should probably be aware of my prejudices. Remember, you should not express a personal opinion in your APS art history essays. But, in the spirit of sharing my prejudices, be warned that I really, really like Goya, another man crush alert. Francisco de Goya started out his career as a court painter. The painting is one of the many designs that he did for the royal tapestry works. Goya's designs caught the eye of the Spanish royal family. Here we see Goya's famous portrait of Charles IV, his very bossy wife, who together with her lover really ruled Spain, and their many children. Just a few quick points of comparison with Velazquez's famous court portrait, also of a Spanish royal family, ancestors in fact. We see similarities in the use of light and shadow, the paintings in the background, and the loose brush strokes that brilliantly capture the sumptuous fabrics. But Las Meninas is all about the artist's intimacy with the royal family. Goya put himself into the royal portrait as well, but unlike Velazquez, he hides himself in the corner. See what I've circled there? Otherwise, you might easily miss his face. Maybe he was right to hide, because Goya barely bothered to disguise his disdain for his royal subjects. We know from Goya's writings that he found the Spanish royal family to be self-indulgent, irresponsible, and unprepared to meet the challenge that the French Revolution and then Napoleon's invasion of Spain would pose to Spain. But before we get there, are these Enlightenment works? or are they romantic works by way? They are not required works. The etching on the right used to show up all the time on the AP exam. It's been replaced with an etching from his other famous series, and we're going to get there in a moment. But these are important transitional works in the move toward Romanticism. Goya's famous series marked a serious departure for the artist, demonstrating his growing awareness of and agreement with the social and political changes that were sweeping across Europe. And here's what Goya wrote in his own newspaper advertisement for these prints. The subjects are chosen, quote, from the multitude of follies and blunders common in every civil society, as well as the vulgar prejudices and lies authorized by custom, ignorance, or interest, those that he has thought most suitable matter for ridicule. To me, that sounds a lot like Hogarth. The etching on the right which is the most famous in the series, seems to suggest that when reason sleeps, all sorts of terrible things emerge. So, this is a tribute to pure, pure rationalism, right? A totally enlightenment piece? Well, Goya wrote a caption for the print that complicates the message. The caption reads, Imagination abandoned by reason produces impossible monsters. United with her, she, that is imagination, is the mother of the arts and the source of their wonders. In other words, Goya believed that imagination 
should never be completely renounced in favor of the strictly rational. For Goya, art is the child that reason produces when it shacks up with imagination. One could argue that this etching gave birth to Romanticism as an art historical period, or at least offered a profound justification for this new development. And then came Napoleon's invasion of Spain. The supposed standard bearers of the Enlightenment, those French revolutionaries, became violent tyrants, and the nightmares became a daily reality. No Goya oil painting made the list. If you listen closely, you might be able to hear the howls of dismay from our fellow art history teachers. You'll recognize this painting, however, since it's all over your textbook. It's one of the most famous paintings in the history of art, and of course, a magnificent example of focal point and use of light as focal point. This video gives a little introduction to Napoleon's invasion of Spain, and that will bring us finally to our required work. Goya print painted the 3rd of May after Napoleon was driven from Spain and the new provincial government commissioned the work. During the Civil War itself, Goya did little painting, but he did make sketches of the horrors of war that he observed. Goya was actually invited to the front by one of the Spanish military leaders of the war against Napoleon. So these are eyewitness accounts, if you will, the battlefield photography of his day. So let's watch one more quick video clip about the series and then look at this work in more detail. What do you notice about the composition? Well, we see another open composition with the newly executed man falling toward us. The man tied to the pole is presumably soon to follow. But what really strikes me is the set of three guns peeking into the painting on the right without the soldiers who undoubtedly are holding them. Why might Goya have done that? To my mind, he's deliberately depicting war as a kind of dehumanizing machine. And it's not only the soldiers who are dehumanized by war. Here is another etching from the series, this time a group of Spanish women fiercely fighting to protect themselves and their children from a group of French soldiers. The images are unrelenting. Here we have rape and dismemberment and starvation and unrelenting death. Before I move on, I should talk a little bit about technique. Be warned, I am venturing way out of my comfort zone. And here's where you would benefit from having an art rather than a history teacher. But armed with some background research, I'm going to try. The Disasters of War series are etchings, which you should recall, I hope, means that the artist carves the basic design into a wax or similar substance on a metal plate and then pours on acid to eat into the uncovered metal. Etched lines are very clean because the acid removes exactly those parts of the plate where the ground has been scratched away. But Goya combined etching with other techniques, some old, some innovative. Engraving is an older print technique than etching. In this process, the artist carves lines into the copper using one of the tr two traditional engraving tools, a burin or a dry point needle. I don't know if this helps, but I found these images on art supply sites. Ain't Google grand. The burin has tapered rectangular ends used to carve lines directly into metal. In dry point, instead of removing the copper from the plate completely, the artist uses a dry point needle to push the copper up into a ridge, that is a burr, alongside the carved line. This produces a softer, more textured line. Aquatint emerged as a printmaking process during Goya's lifetime. The artist applies a very fine dusting of powdered rosin to the etching plate. When this rosin dust is heated, it bonds to the metal plate with each dust particle, particle forming a tiny speck of area that resists acid. The plate is then placed in an acid bath, which produces a fine texture that will hold ink. Aquatint was an innovation because previously, print artists could only create fields of value by making hatched lines, particularly cross-hatching. Aquatint added the element of tone to prints. Variations in tone are created by varying how long different parts of the plate are exposed to acid. It's called aquatint. The effect is rather like that of an watercolor. So I found this example from an aqu aquatint from the earlier Goya series made this point easier to see. Note the subtler gra gradations of tone. 
Moving on with Goya. In his old age, deaf and ill, Goya's visions became increasingly grim and macabre. Holed up in his farmhouse outside Madrid, Goya painted a series of murals on the farmhouse walls that were known as his black paintings. The most famous is on the left, Saturn devouring his children. Maybe the scariest single painting I've ever seen in person. It's ostensibly a very graphic illustration of the classical creation myth, but surely the real subject is the revolution devouring its own children. I hope you remember Goya's rendering of Judith as a bloodthirsty revolutionary woman, another of Goya's black paintings. Meanwhile, back in France, neoclassicism lived on in David's most famous student, Angra. This canvas is nearly 17 feet long, a truly monumental work intended to awe and impress visitors to the French Salon. Like Raphael's School of Athens, on which it's clearly based, Angra's painting is a sacra conversazione, a conversation with period between figures from different periods. This painting did not make the list, and for once I have no complaints. I find Homer being crowned as essentially the king of literature to be a little creepy. But I want you to see this painting because our required painting is not entirely typical of Angra's work. This is a much more interesting painting to my mind, and it also shows that Romanticism was infecting even so die-hard a neoclassicist as Angra. One of Napoleon's otter military adventures was an invasion of Egypt that did not end well. But Napoleon's exploits in North Africa and growing French trade with the region, which France would begin claiming as colonies about 15 years later, stimulated great public interest in the exotic Orient, which, by the way, in this case, meant North Africa and the Near East. Europe was awash in romantic tales of Ottoman sultans with harems filled with lovely ladies. It was considered okay to talk about and portray this kind of sex, because after all, these weren't civilized Europeans or Christians, right? And of course, as artists well understood, sex sold, then as now. Basically, Angra used the exotic setting, much as Renaissance painters used mythological settings, to give their nude paintings a cloak of respectability and some distance from the viewer. This is all going to change. Stay tuned for Monet. Here is a much later Orientalist painting by Angra. Note that he still has a thing for backs, and that those backs had more vertebrae than any pathologist would be able to uncover in an autopsy. So Orientalism is the romantic element of the painting, but really the Odalisque represents a mishmash of styles with a shout out, a lot of shout outs to earlier eras. Angra was a huge fan of Raphael. The Angra painting on the right, painted the same year as our record work, shows Raphael with his mistress. We see mannerist elements as well, especially in the exaggerated length of the body. And of course, we see his teacher David's emphasis on sharp lines and crisp contours. But what we don't see, what comparison am I teeing up with this detail from Goya's 3rd of May? We don't see the loose brushstrokes or evocative use of color that will characterize many romantic works. Angra and most French Academy painters prided themselves on producing virtually invisible brushstrokes. The act of painting itself was disguised. Romantic and then modernist painters would make the involvement of the painter much more obvious and much more explicit. I'm going to end today's lecture with two French painters who, more than any others, have really come to define Romanticism, Théodore Géricault and Eugène Delacroix. There were more past AP questions on this painting than on any other from this period, but nevertheless, the painting has been dropped off the list. And then it showed up on an AP test as a Romanticism attribution question. So I, Delacroix was a friend of Géricault's. Géricault actually used Delacroix as the model for the corpse I've circled here. Note the repeated use of compositional pyramids, very common romantic as well as Baroque painting, and as you will see, a feature in Liberty Leading the People. Jericho also employed a very open composition. The painting is spilling out of its canvas onto our space, really putting us among the corpses. We will see a similar effect in Liberty Leading the People. I'm going to show you more Delacroix paintings in my second lecture on Romanticism, but today we'll end here with our required work and the work that made Delacroix famous and perhaps the most iconic of all French paintings.
the occasion for the painting was the Revolution of 1830. That's actually the revolution that's described in Les Miserables. The revolution succeeded in bringing down the Bourbon King, Charles X, and bringing in Louis Philippe, a more liberal and bourgeois member of the French royal family. Let's close with as much of this excellent video clip as you have